We are a blue marble floating out in space. Over 71% of our planet is covered by water, 3% of which was created by melting glaciers, rainfall, and underground springs that seep out onto the surface. It is this 3% that we call fresh water. Our most important resource and one of the rarest on Earth. This is why we call it blue gold. Without it, humans and the vast majority of the animal kingdom would simply cease to exist. Globally, Freshwater systems such as these support over 140,000 described species, and among those, 55% of all fish species on our planet. I'm currently situated in the UK, a region of global significance because of its high volume and diverse range in freshwater habitats. Here, freshwater habitats cover at least 12% of Britain's landmass. Although abundant in biodiverse richness, in order to survive, species must compete for space and food in such a niche habitat. Biology and behavior have evolved to take advantage of the competitive landscape, creating marvelous adaptations that connect species in more ways than one. Some such species can be found within a single drop of water. Here under the microscope, thousands of different species thrive in an evolutionary arms race unseen by the human eye, each with their own strategy. This is a Daphnia. These planktonic crustaceans have traded size and longevity to invest in early and abundant reproduction. This particular strategy, our selection, is most often utilized by prey species. This group of organisms are in fact at the bottom of the freshwater food chain, and so must work quickly to build up energy for reproduction. In order to do so, they beat their legs constantly at high speeds, producing a current through their shells that vacuums in food particles such as algae and bacteria from their surroundings into their digestive tracts. Their other legs filter particles that they otherwise could not digest. The momentum of the self-created currents propels them through the water to more and more food until they are ready to reproduce. This movement has garnered them the nickname water fleas. Their small size means that this process occurs within milliseconds and their entire life cycles within months. Their size and success in abundant reproduction come at a cost. They are an easy source of nutrition for predators on the prowl, a favorite food of the damselfly nymph. Distinguishable from their dragonfly counterparts by three large fin-like gills on their abdomens used for breathing and locomotion, these predators feed with a flat-toothed lower jaw called a labium, which shoots out like a harpoon, extending and piercing their prey. This underwater creature is not at all what most might connect with damselflies or dragonflies. And yet, 
95% of their life cycles are spent in this form. They stay in this larval state, molting continuously until they are ready to emerge from the water. A transformed hunter with a large arsenal of biological adaptations to aid in its pursuit of larger prey. This is the damselfly as most of us may know it. And on this river, adult banded demoiselles have returned in their dozens. Competition is fierce and their prey quick. But they need to master their new land legs and wings to survive and find a mate. This is no small task. And so, Evolution has provided these damselflies with tools to survive in this aerial kingdom. In order to understand these adaptations, we take a look at the banded damselflies' cousin, the common blue damselfly. Equipped with a pair of compound eyes comprised of as many as 30,000 hexagonal units called omatidia, each acting as an individual eye. Their brains are overloaded with information. Each omatidia informs the damselfly of the slightest movement, contrast in colour and shape, so that they can distinguish their prey and get to it faster than their competition. A challenge they did not have to face in the dark waters during their larval stage. Luckily, these insects have had over 300 million years of evolution to compensate for this sensory overload. Now, 80% of their brains are dedicated to analyzing and assessing this information. But to impress a mate, he will need to do more than just hunt. He must show a mastery over his ability to use his new ultra thin prehistoric wings. Unfortunately, if the wind creates drag, it will cause his wings to vibrate and thus interfere with his ability to glide through the air and put on his performance. This could make his elaborate display harder than anticipated. And yet, the young male is undeterred. Evolution has been kind here as well. At the edge of each wing is a tiny marker a terror stigma. This small mark is actually a weight that stabilizes each wing during flight. Back on the river, the male damoiselle has grown confident in their ability to aid in his flight. So, he takes off in search of a partner to dazzle with his new skills. Success. The pair will latch on to one another, the male grasping the female by the back of her head with abdominal clasps while the female prepares to curl her tail to meet the male's accessory genitalia where he has already transferred his sperm, confident in his ability to acquire a mate. For some, this process takes seconds. For others, hours. Either way, the energy required is enormous and when he is finished, the male must go and recharge before he can attempt this again with another female. Damselflies and dragonflies alike are in fact cold-blooded and so must bask in the sun to get their blood pumping into their wings, ready for another flight. These damselflies are not the only cold-blooded creatures utilising Britain's freshwater systems. Where rivers bring a steady flow of oxygenated water, ponds provide a swampy cover and the perfect breeding grounds for fish and amphibians alike. The favourite meals for a particular reptile on the hunt. These snakes are the longest in Britain, and despite their distinctive yellow and black collar, which would tell any predator that they are highly dangerous, 
They are in fact non-venomous. Instead, they utilize a stealth and strike strategy to capture their prey. In the summer months, ponds are particularly welcoming sites to the grass snake. An ironic name, considering their surprising ability to swim. Unfortunately for him, the later summer months of July and August are an inopportune time to hunt. Most of his preferred hors d'oeuvres are still in their larval stages. A snack too small for the snake's current appetite. But for other species in this pond, the end of summer is merely the first step in a long journey of metamorphosis. Only just reaching his active larva state, this smooth newt breathes with external gills that sit like fans behind his head. The active phase of his larva stage is named as such because the newt is no longer passively feeding on microscopic creatures like Daphnia, but instead have developed reliable tools to take down larger prey. They now have teeth. These stealthy carnivores utilize newly grown legs to perch and creep behind unsuspecting prey species. They must do this carefully and quickly. Other newts born from the same clutch will compete for territory on the pond floor. At this stage, each newt larvae has skin so thin you can observe their entire circulatory system a vulnerability that needs to change soon if it is to survive to adulthood. If he is able to hide and hunt successfully, the newt will reach the eft stage of metamorphosis, where his gills will retract inside his body, his back legs will be fully grown, and he will shed his final layers of skin in preparation to leave the dangers of the pond only to face those on land. He will return to the water again as a mature adult to mate and lay eggs, restarting the entire process. Pond sites alone are predicted to provide over 1.5 million breeding sites for amphibians. And in this pond, newts are not the only amphibians trying to survive. In fact, for these amphibians in particular, newts are exactly what they are trying to avoid. Larvae of the common frog, or as you may know them, tadpoles. The individuals in this pond are attempting to generate their metamorphosis into a land-based adult as quickly as they can. There are many predators about. By this stage in their life cycles, these tadpoles can determine whether or not a pond has enough food and fewer predators, a combination that would enable them to stick around. If not, they accelerate the growth of their back legs, an important tool for escape, and eventually promote the growth of their lungs, which would enable them to breathe out of water. This froglet has begun the process. His fore and back legs are present, and most of his gills have been covered by a new layer of skin. Lungs already installed. He is now waiting for his tail to retract before he's ready to leave these waters. Even then, he will be a tiny frog attempting to make his way out of a big pond. He attempts to emerge from the water, not fully developed to make it on land. One slip and the competition can eat him alive. It is survival of the fittest 
in these niche freshwater environments. And for those willing to compete, they must learn to sink or swim. That is exactly what this insect has learned the art of. Of those insects that hunt on these waterways, the back swimmer is one of the most fascinating. He is not born with the capabilities to breathe underwater, and so spends most of his time floating on his back on the surface. His food source, however, lies at the bottom of this pond, a long distance with no weight belt to help him dive. So, how can he reach them? He begins by utilizing his long hind legs as paddles to propel himself down, his front legs primed to scoop up whatever food he may find. Where other insects cling to vegetation or aquatic animals, the back swimmer relies on speed and power to grab his prey. Therefore, in order to stay submerged, he utilizes the oxygen that he has already stored in his abdomen to create air bubbles at the size and quantities of his choice. He uses these to regulate his buoyancy. Quite like a diver inflating and deflating their BCD jacket to go up and down. Most impressively, he combines his control over these bubbles while pushing himself through the water at alarming speeds. And he does it all backwards. The art of bobbing up and down is not a specialty reserved for backswimmers. Only some may take it a bit slower. These are great pond snails. In all freshwater systems, the temperature in the top layer of the water is very different to that at the bottom. The closer to the sun, the warmer the water. Further down in the dark, it's ice cold. And these snails seemingly like to have their water not too warm and not too cold. So they bob along eating floating algae and debris until they find just the right spot. Unlike their land-based relatives, these freshwater snails have eyes on small swellings close to their tentacles, not at the tips. It is not clear why. Both mollusk groups rely on water to live and not dehydrate. But where their land snails need to produce mucus to survive away from water, this is not an issue for our freshwater-bound pond snails. Instead, they utilize their production of slime to create a membrane barrier to stop them from piercing the surface of the pond and enables them to glide over the squishy silt that collects at the bottom. The mucus of the snail contends with water surface tension an attribute it shares with the leaves of this white water lily. Minute hairs cover the large surface area of its leaves, mimicking the strategy of water skaters and other insects that glide effortlessly across the surface of ponds and lakes. The top of the leaves are coated with a waxy material that repels water so that the plant can access as much sun as possible for photosynthesis an ingenious adaptation to life on water. But these floating freshwater canopies have far more going on than they let on. Below the surface, a vast network of rhizomes cling firmly to the soil. Long and slender stalks sprout and reach for the surface, ultimately unfurling the leaves that we see from above. These stalks hide their own secret strategy of survival. Their cell walls are actually hollow and hold in air that enables the stems to float. Their flexibility 
an additional advantage used to withstand currents and changes in water level. While roots perform the vital task of nutrient absorption and giant leaves create food and synthesize oxygen, the elegant flowers that drift amongst them have their own special talent. A sweet fluid covers the female reproductive organs in the center. The bright white and yellow coloration attracts passing pollinators. If the insect lands onto the sticky substance, the pollen on the victim's legs will be absorbed by the flower. If no insect falls for this trick within the first day of the flower's bloom, the liquid dries and pollen is released. Once pollinated, the flower will sink and develop into a fruit that can contain over 2,000 seeds, which are released into the water, only to sink into the mud below and grow. Where the water flows from the weir in this river, there is a turbulent movement in the otherwise calm flow. The incoming water, however, has worn away at the rocky bottom, providing the perfect habitat for these striking fish. Perch. Many fishermen may believe this fish to be easy to hook, but under the surface, these carnivorous fish are out to find their own catch. In order to avoid becoming a meal themselves, their dorsal fin has evolved a particularly nasty adaptation. The first fin is spiny and can pierce flesh if directly grabbed from above. Hunting in shoals, they utilize lidless eyes to watch out for potential prey. But this is a relatively useless tool when visibility is low. Instead, these fish rely on their lateral line, a system of organs hidden amongst their scales. These specialized rows of receptors called neuromasts sit snugly in a canal under their skin. Its special ability, the detection of movement and pressure changes in the water around them. A dangerous adaptation if you're a minnow. These small fish gather in shoals, their best form of defense. The aim, to be in the middle. Predatory fish like perch can pick off those who sit on the outskirts, while aerial invaders attack from above. The European Kingfisher. Arguably the 007 of the freshwater plane. You'd be lucky to see it as it flies by. A beak so sharp and aerodynamic, it is said to have inspired the shape of the Japanese bullet train. This agent of disguise can only be spotted as blue and orange streak if the sunlight catches it. An illusion. For these birds are otherwise completely colorless brown and forgotten in the safe cover of trees that line the riverbed. So how is it then that we are tricked into seeing such a brilliant display of color? It is because of an ingenious invention. In the natural world, colors of blue and violet are rarely found in typical pigments. So how then do we see them? They are, in fact, just light. The dark pigment, which lines the feathers of the kingfisher, trap tiny structural bubbles of air. These vesicles are so small that they enable larger and longer wavelengths of light, like red, orange, and yellow, to pass through them. 
undeterred by their size. While shorter wavelengths of blue and violet encounter these air pockets, evolved perfectly to match their dimensions, they are unable to pass through and are reflected out for all of us to see. This spectacle is called Tyndall scattering and is the cause of iridescence throughout nature. For this male, it is a brilliant tool to simultaneously hide from threats and attract a mate, but it will do little for its hunting capabilities. In order to perfectly pinpoint and capture his prey, he must compress his feathers and his head into a streamlined position before diving into the water. If he closes his eyes, he will lose his prey. So, he doesn't. The king of fishes has instead evolved a specialized eye shape, more flat and oval than ours. This removes water distortion and enables him to spot prey from his perch above. In order to track his meal as he dives, he quickly switches to a type of binocular vision to help him gauge the speed and distance to his target. A third eyelid waterlocks the lens as he enters. The minnow doesn't stand a chance. This is rivers, streams, lakes and ponds have carved themselves into the British landscape. So too have they created an environment so niche that biology and behavior have had to adapt to keep up. This marvelous menagerie of wildlife has been shaped by these freshwater systems. And we too have adapted to take advantage of this rare resource. It is the heartbeat of humanity and we are utterly reliant on it. Across the globe, we harvest this valuable entity to water our farms, run our factories, navigate our boats, and most importantly, to drink. We have built our entire civilized society on its availability, and yet we seem determined to destroy it. Over the last 50 years, Climate change has increased both the risk of flooding and droughts, creating an imbalance within the ecosystem. Systematic over-abstraction and dumping of pollutants have resulted in a decline of freshwater species and habitats at a rate greater than seen on land or in our oceans. And by 2030, we can predict that over half of the world's population will live in areas of high water stress. Blue gold has never been more valuable, nor so endangered.